Hey everyone, it's Jim. Morning, Jim. How are you? Hey, good. How are you, Robert? Hey, Jim. Yeah. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hey, you. Check on Slack if Erica is able to join. All right, I messaged Erica on Slack, but maybe we can get started in the meanwhile. Let me pull up the agenda items. So a few things I wanted to just do, I saw Jaya, there were a few more comments on the in the document, so we can quickly go through those. I have also another PR submitted um, to add the selectors. So you, you were looking for that feature, right? So we can take a quick look at that and then see if there's anything else to discuss. Okay. Me... That'll be great. Um, basically, uh, you know, we have been socializing this internally within Red Hat and uh, there are some other use cases uh, related to observability where uh, it made sense to, you, you know, use the, use the same CR. So we got okay. some actual input, yeah. Okay, so yeah, let's go through that. I'll pull up the proposal and Okay, so I think the first comment you, uh, the recent one you had added was on severities or categories, right? One of, one category, of those category. Categories, yeah. right? Yeah, so right now category is in the free form section, right? And uh, right. the request I got from uh, one of the other Ds within Red Hat is um, to make it um, more, uh, uh, a well-defined uh, schema element, right? So that, uh, because anything that's in the data is going to be free from, so we really cannot count on it. So so the idea here is that, um, I know you had a comment on, you know, then we'll have to come up with a list of, you know, what are, what are the values right. for it, right? Um, so, yeah, yeah, I think a couple of things that we thought about were some of them could be security related, the others could be health, uh, related like health checks, um, and uh, those were the two we came up with. But we could definitely come up with a few others uh, based on our experience. Um, so that was that was one of the. So this way, you know, the idea here is that um, if the CR is generated, you know, whoever is processing that information can filter out right uh, the ones that they care about. I think that right. was the. Yeah. Um, 
So I think one, one question to think about is, is it still up to the engine that in terms of what categories to define, like say for example, if this is a CIS benchmark report, would those categories potentially be different? Um, or are we defining some high level categories and we want all reports to fall into those, right? So. Yeah, I think that it's the latter, right? So what we were thinking is that we would define some high level categories. Okay. And I agree with you that, you know, we don't want to over, over, over architect this and, you know, right. Define the next level categories and all that, right. That'll become too much. Um, right. But at least if we can put it at a higher level where we know that uh, these kind of mm. reports should be routed to say, maybe a security operation center versus these kind of reports should be routed to uh, incident management tool, right? Um, okay. That's that's the level we are thinking of, right? Okay. All right. Um, would it, and is there a way to tie those into like something like we had talked even about, uh, we had discussed at one point scoring and something like, you know, the CVSS system. Um, so I don't know, I, I haven't researched this enough or looked at it deeply enough to know, but if there's some way or if there's some precedence in terms of what, what you know what some standard categories are then it would be easier for us to say okay we're, we're going to adopt that model right um, i think if we have to come up with some categories the challenge always becomes do we make it extensible is this a string or is it a enum field where it's a fixed list and will all reports you know kind of fall into one or one or more of these categories so Let's, you know, maybe if you want to propose propose a list that we can discuss and review and um, not sure if others like Kapil, Robert, if you guys have any thoughts on this, how to manage. Um, the vocabulary for the data. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the uh, what, uh, Jaya is and is proposing, and I think we have discussed this before, is making category a top-level attribute, so a fixed attribute um, within the policy results, and you know having a set of, uh, I guess, uh, some well-defined categories which reports would fall into, or or each result element would fall into, which. Mm -hmm makes it easier, I guess, if you're searching or trying to scan the results uh, externally. Uh, if we're adding the top level metadata, it might also be useful to have some sort of tool or vendor thing here or some notion of namespacing, like the uh, work with a number of tools that do broad categorization with metadata and um, when I go to on-site installations, it ends up being most orgs end up doing customization to their own, reflect their own internal org standards. And so if we're adding it as a top level tool, a top level key to the metadata, having this notion of either namespacing it or having an additional qualifier of vendor or tool of origin um, helps sort of disambiguate a little bit. Okay. Yeah, so we do have, uh, you know, like in the metadata at the top level of the report, there's, um, there's you know, what Sorry, we propose yeah. is, yeah, we could put engine in there and, and certainly different engines can put, you know, put uh, other metadata as required. I think the, uh, the additional question is in within the results for each element of the report, um, within the results array, should we have a well-defined category and what would that list look like? And just the, the, the feedback from the other PE at Red Hat was with regards to the desire for having a top level category was um, uh, on the basis of like basically we're talking about moving out of data to the top level and I'm just trying to understand right. the differential if you're going to index both where's what's the what's the differential value add 
Yeah, so and this is yeah. So I think um, what we are saying is that uh, if you obviously, you know, right now the proposal is to put category within data, right? But then whatever is in data is all free form, so we cannot count on it being there. By putting category as a top level item, then the consumer of this data could then filter and route it to appropriate uh, destinations. Because I mean, the whole point of generating this data is we want it to be actionable and we want uh, to take some actions off it, right? And uh, the actions could be taken uh, by incident management tools or using security operations center or, you know, depending upon what is emitting this CR, right? So having that category will help us route or uh, filter out things that we need to process. Yeah, I'm so just think, worried about the constraint, the vocabulary constraint here. Um, like at some level, they're, you know, having like, are we, uh, I'm just concerned about being overly prescriptive when it could be an operational concern, it could be a cost concern, it could be a security concern. I mean, the, and so category then becomes almost free form uh, on the value perspective. Um, and at, at, we're already be indexing other fields in this. And so I'm just, it, it's a little bit fuzzy to me on, on like, I understand what you're saying, but I, I feel like we're going to have to be indexing these fields anyways. Um, and there's also the concern around what is the constrained vocabulary that actually makes sense. Yeah, that latter, latter part is what I'm concerned about too. So I think there's two ways to approach, right? One is we could still make category a top level field within resource, but leave it as text, which each engine could decide what categories it's, you know, creating or reporting. Um, so that's slightly better than leaving it in data where there's data is, you know, kind of optional and not structured like Jay is pointing out. Um, the other option is we, we make categories sort of a strict set, which I think, yeah, that would be a concern because maybe not everything falls in that set unless, again, there's some standard we can point to as a precedent. What about category as a top level field, uh, unconstrained text, and, right. also op and also optional? Right, so that, that could be the way to do it. And then maybe it satisfies both both perspectives, right, where for engines that want to have some categories and count on those, we know that, let's say, for example, if it's coming from Rackham, that there will always be a category and Rackham can publish the list of categories that it uh, allocates or assigns to reports. Would something like that potentially work, Jaya, or? Um, I think what you're saying is that we'll make category um, move it to the top level, but then uh, don't be prescriptive in what is put there. Is that what you're, you're proposing? Right. So making an attribute of resource uh, of um, sorry of results. Right. So each result will have a category attribute, just mm -hmm. like we have status and scored, and it will just be text, and it, it will we'll say at least in, in this first release, each engine will be responsible for you know, ma managing its list of categories that it publishes results with. Um, that's a good middle ground. And I think, you know, maybe, you know, based, then based on our experience of applying this, you know, we can, we can come back right. and be more prescriptive, right? Yeah. Okay. I think yeah, I can look. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and if we see some standards sort of de facto approaches emerge, right, we can adopt those and standardize on those. Uh, but yeah, I think that at least gives you a attribute to rely on versus um, not having anything defined in the schema. Yep. Sounds great. Okay. Thanks. So let me you. make a note of that. Um, All right, and then I think the other other comment was on the policy attribute. If that could be a UUID, so versus right now we have it as a string, and in the examples we're showing, you know, names, right? So, 
So I think uh, it, it should be possible to also convert a UUID to a string format and put that in there. So once again, it seems like this would be more of a concern for depending on how you're, what, which engine is reporting. If, if you choose to use UUIDs, you can. Um, was there something that would prevent, I guess, using a UUID in that policy field right now? Um, let me take su that suggestion back and come back to you whether, um, uh, again, you know, I'm looking at it from who it is uh, consuming this, right? Right. Um, so I think the UID maybe is giving us a more, uh, more prescriptive than just it being a string. It could be anything, any string, right? So... Right. So like when, when we were looking at other mappings, like uh, for, for example, for Kiverno, we were thinking of doing policy name slash rule name in this field, right? So mm -hmm. in your example, if you want like a UUID and even then if you want to append or have like a name to make it more readable, you can, or if it's just a UUID, that's fine too. Um, okay. But Maybe. it's some, some way to index back to like a rule or a policy element that created this result, right? Yeah, could we put some examples here? Like the example that you mentioned, right? Um, I think that'll help us because then we can say, um, you already have it here? Yeah, so here it's just pod security colon check. So it's like a, there's two names appended with the colon here. Let me see if there's something else up here. Um, yeah, so here we have similar like API server and then, so here this was like CIS benchmark. So it's the category and then mm. the, the actual rule or the check. But then in metadata, we have like the index, right? So it's certainly possible you could, you know, even do colon 1.2.1 in this first example, if you want to put the index in the name, so it's just free form text over here. Okay. Okay, yeah, let's uh, leave it as a string and let me um, take that back and see whether uh, it's really, really needed, okay? Okay. All right, uh, that sounds good. Um, and I think the other comment I heard was about execution count and looks like execution count is already dropped, right? Yes, so I think I, I might have you know, briefly mentioned that in the last meeting is, so when, when I, I moved things over to the repo and to the CR, um, because you know, the, the timestamp and in, that information is already in the resource metadata, um, I removed the, both the creation timestamp and the execution count. And if we need something like that, we can bring it back. But for now, um, didn't seem like there was a specific need for that. But yeah, if anyone has any other thoughts or comments, we can decide. Okay. Yeah, so there is, you know, one thing I want to do is uh, at some point we should just start, you know, using the Git repo for comments and PRs, right? So uh, maybe we'll, um, after this next set of changes, we can lock the document and just move things over to the Git repos because it'll just be easier to track and comment yeah. on each change and things like that. And I think there's a few, um, you know, one issue. So I just submitted a PR yesterday for the resource scope and selectors. Um, I don't know if anybody knows of a good way to generate documentation out of this, uh, the open API schema or the go tags, but looks like uh, Coop Builder had some facilities, but they no longer work. So, um, it, you know, if there's a good way to generate docs, that's something we need to do so we can review each field and, and the data easily. And then I think we're waiting on additional samples like we've talked about, right? So if there's um, anyone has samples to submit, uh, that would be good to create PRs on as well. 
and we can make sure that they, you know, we can test them quickly with the CR. So currently you can, you can install the CR, you can create um, a YAML that matches that CR and, you know, see what that looks like. So that's probably the easiest way to try things out. So Jim, um, is the next step to take this, uh, uh, I know I, I was not there in that uh, Sigat uh, meeting. I assumed you and Erica went and presented this there, is that correct? We did briefly talk about it and you know, at least socialize the idea. So um, I think what we wanna do first though is uh, show more samples and then also propose uh, how we write like perhaps adapters for or show that you know different engines are using this. So one of the you know on Kiverno we will you know start um, so we currently have a CR for policy violations in Kiverno which we're going to replace with this policy report and produce uh, these reports um, so we'll work on that. And then if there's some, um, like another potential adapter we had targeted was using something like uh, KubeBench, right, for CIS reports. Um, so I think once we have some some examples of that, we can go back to Sigoth and, you know, show that uh, there's uh, actual usage and uh, ways of adapting different reports and what that looks like. Um, and we can also work with, I think there's a list of other projects we had listed in the document as potential uh, for using this. Yeah, I did reach out to the Stira folks and I'll see if uh, I can engage with them to get some feedback. Hey, uh, this is Rita. Um, I, I would like to see how um, we can look at uh, Gatekeeper maybe. Okay. I'm one of the maintainers on Gatekeeper. Um, I did comment in the doc as well. Uh, thanks for driving this, by the way. Sure. Yeah, so definitely, you know, that would be great. Um, um, I, I did have um, uh, some, I guess, questions around, um, I, I know you replied to my comment um, regarding you know, writing the violations uh, of CRs. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, we actually had a community, uh, like la in last week's gatekeeper call, we actually went through all the options um, in terms of like, you know, usability versus uh, scalability versus security, uh, all of these type of concerns with our current implementation for writing yeah. violations to a CR versus you know, Kubernetes events versus, you know, someone even suggested like, oh, yeah, what if you just expose an endpoint for people to like right. query on, right? Um, uh, so I, I created like a table that looks at all the options. Um, and I kind of want to make sure we sync, uh, you know, either here or, or another uh, call, whatever makes sense, just so that we can kind of look at you know, this proposal you're, you're, um, you're looking at is very much still uh, writing to a custom resource, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think based on the usage that we're seeing and the comments from people, um, at least from Gatekeeper's current implementation is not, a, is not really scalable uh, for large clusters. Um, so I wanna make sure we touch point on that and, and, and make sure whatever it is in this proposal it addresses that concern as well. Right. Yeah, so one the evolution of this, I think, um, you know, from some of the early discussions and we went through in prior meetings, a lot of those same options and discussions on what would work best. And looking at whether it's, you know, events, of course, and I think there's some commentary um, in, in this document too on the pros and cons um, looking at things like creating custom resources and um, what we had sort of settled towards or evolved towards was uh, trying to make sure that here the reporting was reflecting current state for admins, right? So we were not, um, not focused so much on any history or historical state because 
the thinking was um, that could be done outside the cluster and it's best done outside the cluster. Um, you know, although again, we're not mandating one way or another. And then the evolution of this, uh, so initially, if you recall, this started out with just reporting violations. And that's what, for example, Kiverno does today. Uh, it reports violations at the, you know, the policy rule level. So for each uh, rule and object, there's a violation CR. And that has some pros and cons too, right? So here, what we will towards is allowing the flexibility of aggregating uh, whether and allowing that also the flexibility for each engine to decide whether it's just violations, whether it's violations and a success summary, or you know some other level of detail and at what scope and granularity they report. So there's a lot of flexibility, um, but it's more or less left up to each policy engine to decide what works best, uh, and that's you know. I guess if you're trying to build a common structure, it seems like that would be the the most, um, I guess, agreeable option overall. Uh, but yeah, at the same time, of course, you know, one this could also be used in a manner where there is still one violation created per uh, per policy rule and per resource, which, like you mentioned, could lead to scaling problems. So that's where uh, there would have to be some intelligence in the engine to make sure that if there's uh, grouping done, let's say for at a namespace level, or if it's something related to the cluster, it could be at the node level, or even just at control plane and nodes, things like that. So yeah, I think what we wanted to make sure is that there's enough flexibility to slice and dice this in many different ways, and then leave it up to the engine to determine what's the best uh, way to report results uh, and focus more or less on current results, not so much on history. But would love to see, you mentioned like the comparison table and perhaps if you want to even, you know, if we want to put that in here or link from this document and then we can discuss. Um, yeah, we can definitely do that. Um, I, I, again, I, I did take a look at the agenda. I didn't see uh, a lot of other topics. So if you don't mind, I, I could share yeah. the table right now, if that, yeah, if your time permits. Okay, cool. Let me just, oh, I cannot start sharing all the other courses. Okay. Um, give me one second. All right. Um, can you see my screen? Let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can now. Okay, cool. Um, again, this is learning. This is basically learning from running Gatekeeper and getting user feedback, right? Um, so definitely, this may not apply to other uh, projects, but um, I think some of these use cases and concerns might be uh, applicable as well, right? Um, so currently, we have two approaches um, in terms of reporting violations. Um, so as you can see, currently uh, we write the violations to the, so constraint and gatekeeper is the, the you can think of them as a, pop, a policy, right? Um, and in, in a, so let's focus on in a large cluster scenario, right? So let's say you have a constraint that looks at, um, you know, do you have resource limits uh, on your pod, right? And let's say your cluster has like thousands and thousands of pods and they're all violating. So this, um, you know, status sub resource could grow quite, um, uh, quite, quite fast, right? Um, and then, uh, so what that means is, essentially, if you use this approach uh, in, in your cluster, in a large cluster, you could run into that SCD one megabyte uh, object limit. Um, uh, not only that, you know, um, this, could also have a huge impact on the API server um, because you know you're basically um, uh, you're basically writing uh, updating the policy um, uh, depending on the number of policies um, you, you uh, the cluster has violations for right um, and I think this is probably the closest to uh, what your um, what the proposal uh, for policy reporting looks like. Um, though I, I understand, you know, it, it does have the flexibility of allowing the policy engine to decide how you want to 
basically shard the updating CR process, right? Whether that's by, you know, like you said, namespace or um, uh, GVK, right? Group version kind. You, you could you could slice it up in a different way um, to reduce that impact, right? Um, but but even even with that, um, you know, there, that that SCD li object limit can still be pretty uh, can can still be there, right? Um, and the other uh, the, so the so we so for Gatekeeper project, we came up with another approach, um, which basically writes all the violations um, for both uh, emission time and uh, you know audit. Um, to write the violations to the gatekeeper logs. Um, and that approach does not run into these limitations because we're writing to the log. Um, however, you know, that will require the consuming uh, solution to uh, basically parse the log, right? Um, and then there's, of course, the Kubernetes events. Um, we really like this approach and this is something uh, we're working on. Um, now, what we like about it is is the fact that you know by default Kubernetes will remove these events right the the, the default TTL is one hour um, and the impact on um, the API server is the number of violating resources and you know the fact that it doesn't have cluster space uh, cannot associate cluster scoped uh, violating resources that can be mitigated by associating this event object to a resource in like say a gatekeeper system uh, namespace. Um, so we think this is uh, actually quite nice because we can leverage a native Kubernetes object. Um, and the fact that it has a TTL, it actually, we can ensure that these objects will get cleaned up. Um, and it, it is kind of similar to the policy reporting uh, report uh, proposal because uh, like you said earlier, it, it's only looking at um, the current state of things rather than a historical uh, record of every, every violations ever, right? Um, and um, some of the other options that were considered, you know, a new violation resource, so another CR, um, and then uh, of course like another uh, endpoint and that allows users to query, but that will, uh, that will require MTLS and um, just a lot more uh, work to make sure this is actually uh, in, in, uh, production ready, I guess. Um, I just kind of want to briefly go through this and, and uh, um, did you guys have any questions or thoughts? Thank you for sharing this. This is a really good summary and touches on a lot of things that we have discussed either in some of the document comments or in prior meetings and sessions. Mm -hmm. um, one just thought and would love to hear from others as well, but I think the, the way we were approaching this as events, it, it's not so much as whether you would want events and a resource, but it's almost like most engines will end up doing both, right? Because events mm -hmm. are necessary and they seem to be solving different, uh, different goals. Mm -hmm. One is to give the cluster admin some state which um, they can easily you know, collect through tools like kubectl, et cetera, to see um, what's going on with policies or polic policy engines they may have configured. Whereas others are, if you're looking at a, something like a pod or a deployment, obviously you want to see events on that to say, maybe there's some violations, et cetera, right? So we were not thinking of that as either or, or, or solving the same goal, but um, the fact that most engines, you know, to be used in production systems would report events, uh, Kubernetes events, which is like you mentioned, a great mechanism uh, for what events are meant for but it didn't seem to be solving at least uh, you know the goals of what we were thinking for the policy report. Mm -hmm. So I so I think um, for the purpose of consolidating and um, ensuring that all the projects have the same uh, I guess spec or APIs, um, do you envision that something like Gatekeeper will then create these new CRs 
based on the proposal? So that's one option where if, if some, you know, policy engines or tools like Gatekeeper natively create the reports, and that's what we were thinking of doing for Kiverno. Um, for other tools, uh, perhaps, you know, the other way of doing this would be to write adapters which are consuming, uh, like say, for example, for Falco or CubeBench, those could have adapters which just produce reports or maybe over time they also have native features to generate these reports. Um, I think there was, Liz had also added some comments for uh, the, you know, the project they were working on uh, where there was interest in also standardizing on the way of reporting. So maybe with that project, um, you know, also policy reports would become native over time. Okay, yeah, that, that's helpful. Um, I, I still think, you know, um, the scalability concerns with, and, you know, the impact on a CD size right. limit is still one that, it, you know, I, I would still go back and think about how to right. mitigate that, yeah. Yeah, so would love to, you know, get, so one, one thing I do want to mention, and sorry, Robert, I, I think you were also meant, trying to mention something, but one, um, so you from, uh, you know, uh, from the Rackham team had also suggested, and um, we just updated the document and as well as uh, submitted a PR for this is, um, adding selectors for, so in your example, like let's say if you have thousands of pods, um, if there's a way to group these pods based on labels, so um, right, you know, one option would be in a result element or even at the scope level, instead of you know naming an object or referring to it by a GVK or something similar, uh, you could then use a label selector uh, to group several objects, maybe hundreds of pods, uh, if it makes sense. So I think there, so again, if there's other ideas for how we can add that level of flexibility to uh, be more concise in the reporting, but point to a larger set of objects. Um, the other thing that one of the options, the problems we run into like with Kiverno is uh, Kiverno also does background scans, right? So it will periodically scan the entire cluster. And there, of course, it's not just, um, you know, at one point it was picking up on even pods that were not being scheduled, not uh, that were failing. But for those sort of things, of course, then um, that, you know, the engine would have to, you know, manage the state and make sure that it's not reporting uh, on objects which are not active. But I totally understand, you know, the concern, um, and I think it would be good to see if there's some other ways to make the report scalable by pointing to a set of objects. Uh, so label selectors was another option that we recently added in just to, to help address that. I was just going to ask Rita, can, can you elaborate a bit more on, on this limitation in FCD that you referred to, this one megabyte limit? Um, yeah, so, so that's the size limit for SCD objects. Um, so basically, um, you know, uh, that's a constraint of, I guess, SCD. Um, and so when we think about, you know, uh, any of the Kubernetes objects or C CRs, um, they they all basically, as, as the size of the object grows, you're, you're going to eventually hit that limit. So one one megabyte size limit, and I can find a um, link to that um, if it helps. Where the docs says that if it helps. So it's it's not a limit in the number of of objects it's just the amount of data encapsulated in each one right so there's size limit per object um but i believe there's also a limit uh for scd as well 
yeah, which so I, would translate to number of objects. Yeah, right. Sorry, go so ahead. There are limits for both. Um, you're right. Like I think it's 1.5 or something like to, to that one megabyte order per object. And then there's some other limits uh, for the total number of objects, et cetera. Interesting. I, I yeah, I just that. linked it to the docs. Cool. I'll take a look there. I, I would have thought that other projects would have hit, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of objects. Um, yeah, I think that's why the recommendation is to keep the object small. Right. Um, at this, if you search for like config maps, I think there was a issue in Kubernetes repo where someone says like, how, how big could my config map object be? And it was also linked to this um, size limit for SCD. Cool, thank you. And by the way, we've already hit that limit when we did like large uh, cluster, uh, like low test. So we're already seeing the errors. Okay. Um, so I think, yeah, on the scalability, this, you know, it would be good to see as we look at different examples to really test out the flexibility of the reporting. And if we can, you know, make it find that right balance with for based on either namespaces, workloads, uh, or other levels of grouping, um, you know, for some of these common common type of policies and reporting that we want to do. If there's any other ideas, uh, yeah, let's, you know, definitely we can ex discuss further on Slack or, you know, just um, like either through Git or even just comments on the document. All right, um, so I did see, uh, Christoph, you had added, you know, an item to the agenda, so I want to make sure we have some time to cover that. Yes, hello everyone. Um, so uh, first, for those of you who may not know me, I want to introduce myself. My name is Christoph Blecker um, and I am a member of the Kubernetes Steering Committee. Um, so I wanted to come and introduce myself uh, and quickly speak about um, a newer initiative that the uh, Kubernetes Steering Committee is, is undertaking with uh, annual reports from our various community groups. The goal of this is um, we are noticing across the community kind of an evolution of just like how information is moving throughout the community. Um, when we look back, you know, over the last like five years, six years or so, um, we in the early days of Kubernetes, we had a Thursday community call that um, b b most people in the community would end up joining um, and, and SIGs and working groups and stuff would, would be giving rotating reports in that particular meeting. Um, however, we, we used to have those every week. We've moved monthly and um, as far as like presentations and that kind of stuff, we're now up to 50 plus different community groups. Um, when you take into account SIGs, working groups, user groups, um, um, et cetera. So trying to get reports in that fashion just isn't, isn't tenable. Um, so we are trying to do this kind of in a more like decentralized manner that, that, that um, all the various community groups can submit reports. And these are then visible and, and, and we can, increase that kind of community cross communication between the various things and working groups that we have. Um, if I can share my screen briefly. Um, um, so uh, an email went out the yesterday to uh, KDEV that kind of explained some of this. Um, we are starting um, with working groups this year in 2020. Um, and the reason we're focusing on working groups is 
working groups are in particular a, a group that requires lots of cross communication between different SIGs and that kind of stuff because by the nature of working groups, they are um, they have many stakeholders themselves. So we're, we're trialing this with the working groups in 2020 to ensure that um, we kind of have a picture and we have like clear communication on what all of our working groups are working on and really asking the question like are our various community groups and working groups are they healthy um are they following best practices as far as like holding meetings on a regular basis recording them putting them on youtube um do you have an open mailing list just kind of going going down that that checklist um the i've also included links to these in the the uh, agenda um, so so folks can kind of pull these up and, and read them on their own um, so the just gonna scroll down to the questions so these are the kind of pieces of information that we're looking to get from all of our various working groups things like um, yeah are your owners files up to date uh, are your sub projects mapped um, you know are your um, is your meeting times is like the listed meeting time, which is something that I actually found with with um, the policy working group, like your listed meeting times and such are not up to date in, in the community repo. Um, so it could be hard to find and encourage people to to come to the meeting if, if there's, you know, still um, things that need to get updated as far as your uh, your times and who the organizers are and, and, and things like that. So um, the reason I'm in particular coming um, to, to the policy working group is because I've been assigned as the liaison from steering to this particular working group. Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of your, your friendly point of contact as far as working with you to get this report done. Um, because we know like the, the nature of, of 2020 right now, there's a lot of things going on. We're not setting like specific like a specific deadline of when this needs to be done by. Um, it's something that we want to kind of work with the, the folks that are involved in the working group um, to, to get it done. I'm, but I, like my kind of like vision would be sometime in the next couple months um, that, that we can collaborate together, go through and get, um, the, go through this annual report process and then kind of gather any feedback of like, was it useful? And do you find like after we collect this working, the, the, the various um, annual reports that we kind of see some action from them? Like the, the, you know, if there is ways that either the community can help you or you can help the community um, that we see those kind of things happen. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I'm wondering if there's any questions. Uh, I, I, one specific question, I think the, this document that you're looking at, uh, I think it was linked in either the email or something. Anyway, I was, I was trying to get to, to the list of questions and I didn't have access. So maybe I can follow up with you later and find out if, uh, if that's something on my end. Or some, some this key. document is in the, the community repo. So I've, I've also linked it in the, um, in the, the meeting minutes, so that's this one and it redirects to our community repo. So this is public open source. So anybody can see this. There's no authentication or anything for this. Okay, there was, there was one link that I, it said that it was like, click here, this list of questions, and then I clicked it and it said it was a Google Doc and I didn't have permission. So I'll, I'll, maybe I'll follow up with you and, and see if uh, that's even necessary. Uh, but overall, yeah, I, I, I applaud the idea. I think it's good to collect it. I would say that, Hopefully it's um, the data once collected is consumable and, and easy to analyze. I guess when, when everything, uh, when all you have is a hammer, a DevOps hammer, everything looks like DevOps. <laughs> so if it was somehow um, uh, codified, you know, uh, scripted and, and available in some re uh, repo or data source or something that we could uh, slice and dice, that would be cool. Yeah, all, all of the all of the annual reports, once they're like finalized, will be like openly published. Um, uh, there is so there are some sections in here where um, like we offer the opportunity for chairs and organizers like 
you know, uh, to basically to come with us for things that might be sensitive initially. Um, you know, if there's, you know, if there are problems like, because I, like, all, you know, there's a bunch of questions in here, but the, the, the key thing that we're trying to get at from a, from a steering committee perspective is, is the group healthy? Um, and that question can mean lots of different things. It can mean, yeah, are you meeting on a regular basis? Um, when people come with new ideas, is there like an openness to them? Um, it can mean that there isn't like, you know, weird dynamics between either the people or the companies that are involved in a particular community group. We want to know if things are healthy. And sometimes, you know, at least initially, there might be things where you're, where like, you know, the organizers, the working group are saying like, no, we're not healthy and here's the reason. And maybe we want to be a little bit more uh, 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 frank and blunt about what's actually going on than something we want to initially publish publicly. So we do offer like there is like kind of a private review period for for these annual reports. But once they're finalized and any private information is like, you know, removed or, or, or sanitized in a way that like everybody, including like the working group and steering feels that it's like ready to go public, then we will be publishing these publicly so that again, the entire community can kind of consume um, that information. And we're also trying to like the, 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 the email that Paris sent kind of goes into some of the goals, but like one, one of the things that I am also like, I'm personally like really passionate about is connecting, connecting positives as well. Like not just the negatives, like we do want to know if a, if a group is unhealthy, but we also want to figure out like if something that a group is doing really well is really working for them, is there a way that we can either like make that a best practice if we can share that information with like another community group or working group that isn't so healthy um and that kind of like cross pollination of information between them um as well as just the raw like what are you working on <laughs> and making sure that everybody knows what what the various groups are working on and if they need help No, this is good. Thank you. And yeah, certainly happy to help and we can work with Erica and Howard also uh, to help fill in some of this. Yeah, so uh, yeah, th this this was just kind of like an initial introduction and discussion. Um, I will be following up with some more like directed emails to to mailing lists and, and to, towards the, the organizers and, and chairs and such um, to kind of get the ball rolling on this. Um, but in the meantime, if there's any um, like questions or comments or that kind of stuff, um, you have you have a face and a name. Like you can come and contact me, um, and I and I can kind of uh, help answer or like direct those questions uh, to the right role. And okay. in general, even outside of this particular process, I am your liaison. Um, I don't make decisions on behalf of the steering committee. Uh, but I am kind of like a communication conduit that like if you need something from the community as a whole or from the steering committee specifically, I am a person that you can kind of come and talk to and I can point you in the right direction uh, as, as far as any of those kind of wider governance issues or, you know, resourcing issues and such. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Um, any other items or things we should discuss today? All right. Doesn't seem so. So thank you, everyone. So I will make updates, um, you know, based on what we discussed for the categories. You, if you can, um, you know, take a look at the PR on the selectors and see if that addresses you know what you were looking for or if there's anything else to be done and we can get that merged and yeah. then you know let's um, read if there's any other ideas um, on the scalability we'd love to discuss and we'll follow up on that as well okay i'm going through the doc again to look for the namespace selector thing you're talking about thanks okay and i'll ping you if i have any questions thanks and sure. I think, uh, Jim, uh, we would like all parties to post uh, examples there, right? Yes. Yes. So just please create PRs with some samples and, you know, because that will help us form up the structure. 
and yeah. you know also if we can start um, you know so just uh, you can just create a PR directly on the Git repo. Um, yeah, and if there's anything else that comes up that we feel we need in the reports, we can you know that will help flush that out. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.